Hello and welcome to the 2021 production of the Red Throated League performing Death Holds the Prompt Book, a Sherlock Holmes radio adventure by Edith Miser. This is our premier Zoom performance and we very much appreciate you tuning in. This script was first broadcast on April 12, 1933, almost exactly 88 years ago. Edith Miser first brought Sherlock Holmes to the radio in 1930. Over the next 18 years, she adapted most of Arthur Conan Doyle's original Sherlock Holmes stories for radio and also created many original adventures, like the one you are about to see. In 1986, Ms. Miser donated her collection of Sherlockian manuscripts and related material to the University of Minnesota. The Red Throated League is proud to work with the Sherlock Holmes collections at the University of Minnesota Libraries, as well as the Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota to bring you one more of these wonderful stories. We would like to dedicate this performance to a former member of our company, Mary Manthe. She passed beyond the Reichenbach on January 20th, 2021, and we stand together on the terrace to remember her and her contributions to the Red Throated League. Now please, cast your imaginations back to the golden age of radio, or even further, to when it was always 1895. From New York, the makers of G. Washington Coffee present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson, by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And that's the cue to take <laughs> take the lid off the can. <laughs> I know, Mr. Bill. I know. Dr. Drop a chair. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, let's see. Where, where, where was I? A teaspoonful of G. Washington coffee crystals in each cup. Uh, of course. Uh, of course. Yours first. Now mine. Add the hot water. Uh, now, Mr. Bell, I don't need pumping a second time. You'll give our listeners an idea that I'm getting a bit doddery. Uh, wh where was I? The hot. Oh, <laughs> the hot water. Of course, of course. Uh, well, there we are. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of prompting, that reminds me of the only occasion during my large and checkered partnership with Sherlock Holmes, the one occasion when I found myself definitely on the wrong side of the law. Oh, I admit occasionally we s skated on pretty thin ice now and then, but that's the only time I was ever arrested. Arrested? Uh, you know, apprehended, nicked, uh, chucked into jail, I, that, <coughs> that sort of thing. Good Lord, what for? Yeah, attempting to do a chap in. You mean you, you tried to kill somebody? Uh, <coughs> certainly not. Nothing was further from my mind. I was only the stage manager, but the official police seemed to <coughs> think I was responsible. And I must say, Holmes took his own sweet time clearing the matter up. I spent one entire night behind bars, completely soured me on amateur theatricals, I can tell you. I'm, I'm afraid I don't quite understand, Doctor Watson. Um, I say I, I, I dare say I haven't been very explicit. It makes me boil whenever I think about it. Uh, never once, never wanted to stage manage the confounded performance in the first place. But no one seemed to think very highly of my acting ability, and everybody had to do something to help out. 
Besides, it was the stage manager's job to keep an eye on the jewels, and Holmes wanted somebody that he could trust. But why be concerned about stage jewelry? Everyone knows it's nothing but paste. Uh, that's where you're wrong, at least in this case. Those were the famous Musgrave jewels, the ancient crown of the kings of England. You remember I told you the story of the Musgrave ritual, how Holmes went down to the manor house of Earlston at the request of his former college friend, Reginald Musgrave, to solve the mystery of a missing butler. Of course. He found the butler dead in a pit in the cellar of the house. <laughs> exactly. He had tried to rob the family of a forgotten treasure entrusted to one of Musgrave's ancestors by Charles I. And among other things, the treasure contained the ancient crown of the kings of England. Exactly. Well, Reginald Musgrave had some legal bother and a considerable sum of money to pay before he was allowed to keep that crown at Hurlston. But keep it, he did. Although the authorities advised against it, a thing like that is a, is a veritable magnet for criminals, as Holmes has always said. Uh, however, young Musgrave was reasonably careful, always kept the thing safely locked up, except on very special occasions, such as those amateur theatricals that I was telling you about. What's the connection between the amateur theatricals and the ancient crown of the kings of England? Oh, well, it was used in the last act, the, the, the wedding scene. The heroine was masquerading as a page, but was really the niece of King Otto. And so when the handsome young stranger turned out to be the Prince of Bulgravia and not a highway robber, well, they were married. I suppose that's as good a reason as any. <laughs> yeah, I, I never quite understood what it, the thing was all about, but with keeping the prop straight and seeing Lady Betty got the purple note in the stick in scene Act Two and not the King's Pardon. That went in in Act 5, Scene 3. And then there was Lord Boccaccio, Boccaccio's dagger. He stabbed himself in Act 4, Scene 1. Poisoned wine glasses, the royal signet ring, and the pistols, and the offstage horses, who clashing of swords. Not to mention keeping an eye on that prop book when the actors forgot their lines. On top of all that, the responsibility for that crown, that confounded crown. Sounds if you had a rather hectic time of it. A hectic. <laughs> Let me assure you, Mr. Bell, a uh, one-armed paper hanger with the itch is a drone and idler compared to your old friend John Watson. During the rehearsals of The Robber's Revenge, or Love Will Find a Way. Yes, but I still don't understand the purpose of the Musgrave crown. Well, it, it, that was the bait, Mr. Bell. The come on, as you Americans call it. The, the performance was to be for charity, of course. All the Aunt Berthas and Cousin Sarahs might not be willing to fork over the required shekels to see little Nellie Kelly carry the Queen's train in Act 1, Scene 5, but they'd gladly pay twice that amount to get a good look at Reggie Musgrave's lately reclaimed <laughs> family jewels. I think I begin to see, and you and Holmes were invited down to keep an eye on the family sparklers while they were doing their bit for sweet charity's sake. Exactly. Although that was not the reason given to Reginald Musgrave's house guests. They were led to believe Holmes was some famous dramatic coach come down to Hurlston to put the final touches on the performance. I was his assistant, and I must say, the way Holmes put everyone through his paces, no one would ever have suspected he hadn't been born and brought up on the other side of the footlights. We arrived at Hurlston on a Wednesday. The play was to be given Saturday night. Things were very gay. You know how it is, Mr. Bell. Nothing like rehearsals to break the ice at any house party. Everybody calling everybody else by the name of their character in the play. Everywhere you will... You see people going over their lines, rehearsing scenes, trying on costumes. I will say, I stumbled on some love scenes that were never found in the play itself. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Friday afternoon came. We were going through our dress rehearsal. A few slight mishaps, of course. Reginald Musgrave, who was playing the handsome hero, had a stepladder fall on him. He acquired a bit of a black eye. The general's sword was stuck in its scabbard. The innkeeper's trousers were too tight for him to sit down. Otherwise, things were going 
quite as smoothly as could be expected. Oh, this is too exciting. Wait, I just love good My goodness. Honey, <laughs> really? the last Wait. Scene. Just a moment, Holmes. I'll, I'll cut round and get the blasted crown out of the safe so they can set the scene after this while we're changing our costumes. Good idea, Reginald. But don't dawdle. It's nearly time for the dressing bell, and we've got two more scenes to do. It's be back in a jiffy. All the props ready, Watson? Watson? Confound it, where is the man? Watson! Uh, coming, coming, co coming, co uh, what's up, Holmes? Oh, there you are. Where in blazes were you hiding? Uh, me? No, nowhere at all, nowhere at all. I was just loading the blanks into this revolver for this scene. Hmm, let's see. Yes, the weapon's a trifle modern for a play of this period. Really should be an old horse pistol. Yes, but you can't get blanks for that sort of blunderbuss these day, Holmes. No, I suppose not. All the rest of the props for the scene ready? Uh, yeah, 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 yes. They're all on the prop table outside the door of the set. Uh, let me see now. Uh, um, lace handkerchief, a one, uh, two wine glasses, the, the fatal letter, and this pistol. That's the lot. Mr. Holmes, I, I say, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Dr. Jeffrey? Couldn't we get on with the rehearsal? The innkeeper's costume of mine may be very picturesque, but the trousers are dashed tight. I don't dare sit down for fear of committing Harry Carey. Whatever does he mean? Will somebody take Betty aside and um, explain the facts of life to her? <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, Holmes. Here's the regal bonnet. Oh, <laughs> Reggie, isn't it handsome? Yes. Watson, dash uncomfortable. Watson, come here, will you? Uh, now what, uh, Holmes? I, you know, I really have more than I can manage. Well, here's another little trinket for you to keep your eyes on. Oh, that crown. Uh, oh, my sacred Aunt Mahidabel. What a lot of sparklers. It's the hereditary crown of the early rulers of England. Unique and priceless. Hmm. One American millionaire offered me a king's ransom for a king's crown. <laughs> but I told him I wouldn't dream of parting with it at any price. You should have seen his face. First time, his money hadn't been able to buy something that he wanted. <laughs> well, here's the crown, Watson. Don't let it out of your sight. Uh, yes, but, but, but Holmes, look here. That, that's really not possible with all the bobbing about I've got to do. Op opening, shutting doors, tossing papers, snow all over. How am I going to keep an eye on the blasted thing? I don't like to leave it on the prop table with the rest of all these things. Hmm, that's true. You'd better wear it. <laughs> wear, wear it? A fine sight. I'd be dashing around with that thing on my head. It looks deuced uncomfortable. What's more? And at least you'll know where it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Here you are, Watson. I crown you king of pandemonia. <laughs> <laughs> now then, quiet, everybody. I want to run through the scene at the end once more, beginning with the meeting of the two lovers. I know you don't mind running through that bit, Reggie. Rather not. Can't do it often enough to suit me. Reggie! All ready then, we'll go right through it. Reggie, you come in out of the storm and find Miss Betty sitting by the fire. You play your scene, you're about to kiss her, when the innkeeper rushes in to warn you that Sir Boccaccio is hard on your trail and threatening to kill you. Look here, Holmes. Um, couldn't Dr. Jeffrey wait until after the kiss to come bouncing in? Hmm? Reggie, you're impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Reggie. It seems much too long now. I never have any luck. Then, before the two lovers have time to flee, Sir Boccaccio bursts in. There's the quarrel. Sir Boccaccio shoots and the hero falls. Curtain. Everything straight? Sir Boccaccio's pistol is on the prop table, Lord Hubert. Righto. I only hope the thing goes off at the right time. You never know with blanks somehow. Tricky things. Eh? 
Everybody ready? Miss Betty, if you will sit by the fire and start the scene, please. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Watson, Watson, snow. Don't forget the snow and bring the wind up when the door opens. All right, all right. Give me some time, won't you? Ah, here comes the snow. A bit gusty, but still, it's snow. Now then, Miss Betty. Ah, me. The snow flies faster and faster, and night draws on apace. What if he does not arrive? What if they have captured him? Perchance he has lost his way. Hark, I hear footsteps. Footsteps, Watson, footsteps. Ah, his footsteps. Ronald. Betty, I, I mean Alicia. Reggie, the door. Don't forget to close the door. There's a storm outside. Right. Alicia! I thought you would never come. Your note said you needed me. My darling, what dangers would I not brave to be by your side? Through raging torrents, hostile armies, fire and plague. But Ronald, my love, I sent no note. Rather, am I here at your behest? Your letter bade me meet you at this inn. My letter? Let me see it. Uh, have you it by you? I have kept it here, next my heart. Mm. Oh dear, it seems to have slipped. I can't reach it. Never mind. Go on, go on. Ah, ah uh, as I thought. It is no letter of mine. It is in Sir Boccaccio's foul hand. Ronald, then this? This is a trap? We must fly, uh, flee, fly. I, I can never remember which it is. Ne never mind. Either one will do. It is one fond embrace before we depart into the outer darkness. Ronald, my darling. Alicia, my own. Reggie, <clears throat> don't. Th this is where the innkeeper bursts in. Yes, I know, but but Doctor Jeffrey seems to be asleep at the switch. It isn't my fault. The play must go on, you know. <laughs> At least you're my own. Reggie. Reggie? <laughs> Watson, Watson, where are you? Uh, it, it, here I am. What's the matter? Where's the innkeeper? You mean uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey? Of course, of course. Well, he had to go back up to his room just as the queue came, his britches split. Good Lord, what next? Never mind. We'll run through the scene without him. You read his lines, Watson. He only has a few in this scene. Go back. Please, everybody. Off stage, Watson. Oh, very well. Now then, Reggie, just give him the cue. One fond embrace before we depart into the outer darkness. Ronald, darling. Alicia, my own. Watson, why the knocking? It's the innkeeper's own inn. Uh, I thought, I know, but they're playing a love scene. It seems much more delicate to knock, doesn't it? We, we haven't time for that. They're in danger. Go back and try again. Just the embrace, Reggie. Ah, seems to be my lucky day after all. Reggie, really? Alicia, my own. Uh, Sir Ronald, he comes, Sir Boccaccio. Already he storms up the storms up the hill from the village. Merciful heavens! He has cut off my repeat uh, retreat. <laughs> For myself, I do not care. But we must hide the Lady Alicia. Too late, my friend. Aha! I thought I would find you here, cooing like two lovebirds. Well, the white dove, the Lady Alicia, she shall belong to me. Never! 
so long as the breath of life stirs in this body. That will not be over long, Sarah. Ronald, beware his pistol. Um, help. Lord Ronald has been shot. No, no, Watson. Wait until the pistol goes off before you mm. say that line. My mm. fault. The safety catch wasn't pulled back. I, I couldn't fire the blasted thing. Oh, dear, does he have to shoot? The noise terrifies me. Hubert, why can't you just use a dagger instead? It, it's so much neater. Uh, nonsense, Betty. Gentlemen didn't go around stabbing at each other in those days. Besides, a good revolver shot puts some snap into a scene. All right, let's do it over again. From the place where Boccaccio says Lady Alicia belongs to him. And Watson, put some fire into that last speech. It's the curtain line, remember? Hmm. Uh, it made me more like, um, like this. Uh, help, Sir Ronald, he is shot. Is that the best you can do? Hmm. Help, Sir Ronald, he is shot. Oh, never mind, never mind, just Play the scene. Lady Alicia, she shall belong to me. Never so long as the breath of life stirs in this body. That shall not be over long, Sarah. Ronald, beware his pistol. <laughs> oh. Lie there, you dastard. Ronald, my love. Reggie? Reggie, <gasps> look, his shirt, it's covered with blood. What, Betty, what's the matter? What happened to Ronald, Reggie? Uh, good Lord, he is shot. My goodness, Dr. Watson, what a curtain line. I can't wait for the second act. Well, that's what this in intermission is all about, Mr. Bell. A chance to fortify yourself for the plot twists and turns ahead. And also to grab a fresh cup of G. Washington coffee. Folks, the makers of G. Washington coffee want you to enjoy your intermission. So they've done the hard work for you. G. Washington coffee dissolves instantly in hot or cold water. And it has all the kick you want for you can make each cup as strong or as weak as desired and always fresh. 85% of the coffee bean, wood fiber, chaff, and other byproduct matter has been removed by Mr. Washington's refining process, and each can holds enough for many cups. Because you can make as much or as little as you wish, there's no waste in the coffee pot. And if you find that coffee leaves you a little too jittery to enjoy a good mystery like the ones Dr. Watson gives us here, try our new line of tea broker teas. Whether you enjoy the brisk flavor of Mincing Lane Morning Blend or prefer a calming cup of Hudson's Herbal Helper, our new teas will set the stage for any problems or mysteries that you might have to solve. Now, speaking of setting a stage for a mystery, Dr. Watson, won't you take us back to Hurlston Manor and show us how Sherlock Holmes solved the shooting of Reginald Musgrave? Oh, <laughs> very well, Mr. Bell. Just one more sip. Mm -hmm. On we go. I remember well the consternation backstage. <laughs> I don't understand how it happened. I just picked the revolver off the prop table. I had no idea, of course, that it was loaded with real cartridges. Oh, but, but it wasn't, Sir Hubert. I, I put in blanks just before the scene started. I think you'd better give me that revolver, Sir Hubert. Yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Holmes. I, I never want to see the thing again. To think 
that I shot Reggie. It's it's too horrible. Hmm. Five cartridges still left unfired in this revolver, and all of them regulation cartridges. Uh, but I put in blanks, Holmes. I keep telling you, they were blanks. Magistrate will be most interested in your explanation, Dr. Watson, I'm sure. <clears throat> oh, Dr. Jeffrey, how is Reggie? Is he going to live? You can save him. Dr. Jeffrey, you must yes, be able to. I think I can safely say Reginald Musgrave will manage to pull through all right. The bullet lodged in a muscle. I had to perform a bit of an operation. Oh, thank heavens you were here when it happened. I don't know what I'd have done, if anything. I mean, Reggie. Steady, Miss Betty, steady. You can't give way now, you know. Reggie will want to see you. Sorry, but I can't permit my patient to see anyone, at least for a day or two. He has a bit of a fever. Excitement might be very dangerous. But surely Mr. Musgrave's fiance. Sorry, that's my rule, and I can't have it broken for anyone. Except, of course, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson is an expert in fever cases, Dr. Jeffrey, as you doubtless know. He is not a surgeon, but now that the bullet has been removed, I feel sure you will allow him to assist you in your... I'm afraid I shall have to deprive myself of the pleasure of Dr. Watson's assistance. You see, the village constable happened to be in the kitchen, and I feel it incumbent upon me to give Dr. Watson in charge. After all, he was responsible for the loading of that revolver. Uh, but, but I, I, I... Oh, come, Dr. Jaffrey. It was an accident. I'm sure Reggie is the last person in the world to want to press charges against. Unfortunately, Mr. Musgrave is in no condition to act for himself. And inasmuch as I live in this district myself, I naturally feel the responsibility of enforcing law and order. In short, Jenkins... Yes, sir. Arrest this gentleman and take him down to the jail. I'll get in touch with the magistrate myself. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey, uh, what shall I say is the charge? Attempted murder. Dr. Jeffrey, it was an accident. Dr. Watson thought they were blanks. He didn't intend to have Reggie shot. I, I know they were blank. They, they were blanks. Take him away. Uh, Holmes, for heaven's sake, tell them. They were blanks. Explain to him. They were blanks. Sorry, Watson, but I'm not so sure. This isn't the first time you've been a bit absent-minded, you know. Uh, Holmes, you too... I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, come along, you, and never mind the gab. Ah. One minute. Before you go, Watson, don't you think you'd better turn over that crown you're wearing? Uh, good Lord, I've forgotten all about it. Here, take it. I never want to see the blasted thing again. Thank you, Watson. Now, come on, you. I'll relieve you of that, Mr. Holmes, if you don't mind. After all, I'm a closer friend of Reggie's than you are, and that crown is... Rather a responsibility. Quite. But you forget, my dear Dr. Jeffrey, that there is someone here who is closer to Reginald Musgrave than either of us, his fiance. Allow me, Miss Betty, the Musgrave crown. I know it will be safe with you. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. I I'll put it back in the safe right away. Is that you? Yes, Miss Betty. Oh, I'm so glad you're still up. I'm so nervous. I had to come downstairs again. You see, Reggie told me you were a detective. Does anyone else here know? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure no one does. Good. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must help me. It's about the crown. I wasn't able to- To put it back in the safe? 
because the safe was closed. And Dr. Jeffrey won't let me see Reggie to get the combination from him, but how did you know? I saw the person who was responsible for all this trouble sneak into the study and shut the door of the safe before you had a chance to return the crown. Then you think the crown is in danger? Undoubtedly. The shooting of Mr. Musgrave, the closing of the safe, everything was planned so that someone in this household could get hold of that crown tonight. You mean it wasn't an accident, Reggie being shot like that? Certainly not. Watson did load that revolver with blanks. The real cartridges were substitutes sometime after the playing of the scene had begun. How did you know? Quite simple. Watson's fingerprints were not on that revolver. They had been wiped off by the person who reloaded the gun when he carefully removed his own prints. One can sometimes be too clever for one's own good. Then Dr. Watson isn't responsible. Certainly not. But then why did you let them arrest him? Because I did not want the real criminal to think I suspected anything was amiss. It's a very clever and ruthless individual we're dealing with, Miss Betty. Yes, Reggie. Reggie might have been killed by that revolver. Quite. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I must get back to my room. The crown is there. Perhaps I've been gone too long. Don't be alarmed, Miss Betty. The door of your room is directly opposite the head of the stairs. I have not taken my off it for a moment. By the way, Miss Betty, you, you have hidden the crown carefully. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, it's, it's in one of the large puff sleeves of my ball gown. Yes. You said you saw the guilty person close the door of the safe. Then you must know who it is. I knew before that, Miss Betty. He not only closed the door of the safe, he is the only person who had the opportunity of tampering with that gun. Only the persons who were in the scene of the inn were backstage. All the rest of the players were out front watching the rehearsal. But there were so few of us, just um, Dr. Watson, Sir Hubert, Reggie, Dr. Jeffrey, and of course myself. But I didn't do it, Miss Holmes, I swear I didn't. I believe you, my dear. You didn't go backstage at all. You entered the set from the front of the house and never left the stage. That's right, I'd forgotten that. Then if you say it wasn't Dr. Watson, and of course it wasn't Reggie. Why not? Well, Mr. Holmes, surely a man isn't going to rob himself. They have, my dear. Think of the insurance on that crown. However, don't look so alarmed, Miss Betty. A man may take a chance on robbing himself, but he's not likely to arrange to have himself shot at. Uh, no, of course not. Then it must be either Sir Hubert or Dr. Jeffrey. Oh, but Dr. Jeffrey was upstairs. His uh, trousers, you remember, Mr. Holmes. Uh, quite. Uh, then Hubert might be the man. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you know who he is, why don't you have him arrested? Because, my dear, seeing a man shut a safe door and a revolver minus a set of fingerprints is not proof. We must catch the devil red-handed when he comes after that crown tonight. Oh, Mr. Holmes. And now, Miss Kitty, if you will return to your room, if our friend enters it and finds you gone, he may suspect a trap. Don't be alarmed, my dear. You're quite safe. I shall be watching your door. Above all, don't put up any resistance. The man is quite capable of putting you out of the way. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Of course, if you're afraid, I can't blame you. If you refuse to... Oh, I, I am afraid, but I'm not going to back out of it. The crown belongs to Reggie and he's in no position to look after it. Good girl. Now run on upstairs. And remember, let him find it. We must catch the criminal with the crown in his hands. That's 
funny. I was sure I left that lamp on when I went downstairs. Oh dear, what if someone's been here while I'm gone? No, no, that's not possible. Mr. Holmes said he didn't take his eyes off the door. Still, oh dear, I wish tonight were over. The moonlight looks so weird and misty. Maybe I'd better just look in again and see if the crown is safe. Oh dear, the wardrobe door is stuck again. Mm. Mm. Oh no, I got it open. Um, let's see. Yes. Yes, it's it's still safe. Don't move. <gasps> Don't move. Don't scream, or I'll shoot. Dr. Jeffrey! Then it was you! Quite. Thank you so much, my dear, for showing me where the crown was hidden. I might have wasted quite a lot of precious time tearing the room inside out. But how did you get in? I mean, we... Yes, I know. You and your precious detective thought you'd catch me entering your bedroom door, eh? But I was too smart for you. Came in by the window. The window? You consider that impossible? Well, for the ordinary man it might be, but, uh, perhaps, but, uh, not for me. Tell your Mr. Sherlock Holmes that he is not as smart as he thinks he is. And now, my dear, you will pardon me if I leave somewhat unceremoniously by the way I came. Oh, no, you don't. Stay Mr. with Holmes. Mr. Holmes! I may not be as smart as I think I am, Dr. Jeffrey, but I'm a good deal smarter than your opinion of me. From my position in the hallway downstairs, I not only had a view of this doorway, but by peeking through the oriel window, I had an excellent vista of the outside of the house immediately surrounding Miss Betty's window. Knowing you to be quite a proficient alpine climber, I guessed you might take that way. The devil you did. Quite. I also know, my dear Dr. Jeffrey, that this is not the first time you have acted as the representative of Mr. Junius Kidd the American millionaire, who is not overly scrupulous as to the method in which he adds to his famous collection. Well, Dr. Watson, that's a nice bit of deduction, but I thought Dr. Jeffrey was upstairs in his room when the shot was fired. <laughs> So he was, Mr. Bell, so he was. His trousers did not rip until his cue to go on the stage. Remember that? He had ample time to reload that revolver while I was busy with that silly snow and wind machine. So he did. Well, listeners, when you find yourselves too busy with everything you have to do, remember that the makers of G. Washington Coffee want to make your lives easier and more enjoyable. Whether you're preparing a fresh, fast cup of coffee or one of our new tea broker teas, you will enjoy the convenience and comfort of our healthful, delicious, and economical beverages. The makers of G. Washington Coffee and Tea Brokers Tea have brought you another in this new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced by the Red-Throated League the Norwegian Explorers, and the University, University of Minnesota Library's Special Collections. Our theme music was composed by Albert Berman. Be sure to listen next year to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the cadaver in the Roman toga. This is Joseph Bell speaking for G. Washington Coffee and KRTL. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Ladies and gentlemen, and all of our friends, thank you so much for joining us. And let me introduce our amazingly talented cast and crew. Take it away. Uh, I'm Bill Teeple, and I play Joseph Bell, the announcer, not the doctor, and Sir Hubert. I'm Peter Cavanaugh, and I was Dr. Watson. I'm Tom Gottwald, president of the Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota, and I played Sherlock Holmes. And John Clemo is currently on mute. Uh, hi, I'm John Clemo. I'm the artistic director of the True North Theater in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I played Reggie Musgrave and Constable Jenkins. I'm David Harnwall from the I Am Lost Without My Boswell podcast. And I played Dr. Jeffrey. I'm Graham Leathers. And I played the incredibly talented and authentic sound Foley guy. I'm Morva Klein and I play keyboards. And I am Karen Ellery, the director of the Red Throated League, and I played Betty. Thank you all for joining us. Many, many happy airwaves to you all. Mm -hmm.